Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Vada, for that extremely generous introduction. It is, of course, a really great pleasure for me to be here in Israel. It's always I very much enjoy coming, and it's a great honor to be able to address you this morning. It's become pretty much common currency to view the development of malignant clones in cancer as part of a Darwinian evolutionary process. That evolutionary process is targeted at single cells rather than the whole organism. The environment that is applying selection pressures is the microenvironment of tissues working on those single cells rather than the environment around us. And the variation that is under selection is somatically acquired variation rather than the inherited variation of the whole organism. Nevertheless, with those caveats, the evolution of a cancer clone <clears throat> bears a lot of similarities to Darwinian evolution. And we're going to learn a lot about that process of Darwinian <coughs> evolution in the next few years through studying the final product of that process of evolution, which is the cancer genome itself. So we can start by reflecting for a few moments on what it is we expect to find by sequencing cancer genomes. This is a single cell from a late stage cancer. And for that cell, as in any other cell in the cancer or indeed any other cell in the body, it is possible to construct a, a lineage of cell divisions going all the way back to the fertilized egg. And I'm showing you here snapshots of that lineage, where the, lineage is, where the cells in the lineage are colored brown. They have already acquired partly or fully the neoplastic phenotype and are partially or fully transformed. And where the cells in the lineage are colored in blue, they're within normal tissues. And as this lineage develops over the course of a lifetime, somatic mutations occur. And they occur in a cumulative fashion, such that a somatic mutation such as this one here, which may have occurred after the first division of the fertilized egg into two cells, that somatic mutation is still present in the cancer cell right at the end of the lineage. Now, there are a number of influences that cause those somatic mutations over the course of a lifetime. There can be the intrinsic lack of complete fidelity of DNA replication mechanisms. They have to replicate 3,000 million, or in fact, 6,000 million base pairs of DNA in every mitotic cell division. That's a pretty stern task. A very few errors are made, but enough errors to contribute to this accumulation of somatic mutations. Then, during adulthood, there may be a number of environmental or lifestyle exposures which, depending on the tissue of the body, contribute to the acquisition of somatic mutations and can change the patterns of somatic mutations. And those can include tobacco consumption, it can, be due, it can include exposure to ultraviolet light on the skin, and there could be many other chemicals that are influencing the somatic mutation rate in various different tissues of the body. Many of those could be ex exogenous, like tobacco carcinogens, but there could be many endogenous chemicals and carcinogens, such as reactive oxygen species, which are contributing to this somatic mutational load. And then, once the lineage enters the neoplastic phase, there may be defects, for example, of DNA repair, and those also increase the rate of somatic mutation acquisition and can change the pattern. And finally, we can add to the load of somatic mutations ourselves because, of course, many chemotherapeutics are somatic mutagens. Now, we're used to now classifying these somatic mutations in cancer into two functional categories. The first is the so-called driver mutations, which are illustrated here as little stars. And these are the mutations that cause clonal selective advantage. These are the mutations which disrupt 
key pathways, enabling the cancer clones to grow better, faster than their neighboring cells. Now, the number of somatic driver mutations that are present in an individual cancer and that are required for the development of an individual somatic cancer has been a matter of speculation over decades. And age incident studies, epidemiological studies, have suggested that it takes something of the order of five to seven rate-limiting hits. These are statistical ideas, these rate-limiting hits, to, to cause a single common adult epithelial cancer. And those five to seven statistical hits have been converted into the speculation that there are five to seven driver mutations that are required for the development of an individual human cancer. The number of drivers which has been speculated on and hopefully will be elucidated by some of the results I'm going to show you. The number of drivers reflects the number of pathways that have to be subverted to convert a normal cell into a cancer cell and also more or less reflects the number of clonal expansions that have taken place to get to that final cancer. So those driver mutations are embedded in a sea of passengers. And the number of passenger mutations that you find in the, la in the final cell, and the passengers do not contribute at all, that's the concept, to the development of ca the cancer. The number of passengers is a reflection of the number of cell divisions, or mitoses, in this lineage, going back to the fertilized egg, and, of course, the mutation rate at each of those mitoses. So, when we come to sequence this final cancer genome here, what we're going to be finding is the driver mutations, one to ten or more, and they should give us some sort of idea about the selective forces that have been operative on the cancer cell to allow it to grow better than its normal neighbors. And we'll be finding tens to 100,000 or more passengers, because we already know the number of passenger mutations that's present in an individual cancer can be hugely variable. But those passenger mutations should give us some idea about these mutational processes that have been operating during the course of the lifetime of the patient to generate the cancer in the first place, because those mutational processes may have left their imprint in their types of mutations on that final catalogue of mutations that we find here. So that's what we hope to extract. With respect to driver mutations in cancer and the cancer genes in which they occur, finding those cancer genes has been a central aim of cancer research for the last three decades, and it's been a pretty successful enterprise. Um, our most recent count indicates that there are well over 400 genes in the human genome which are mutated by one or other of the types of mutations, base substitutions, indels, rearrangements, copy number changes, in, and that those 400 odd genes can contribute, are causally implicated, the mutations in those genes are causally implicated in the genesis of the one or other of the 200 different types of human cancer. So 400 odd genes, most of those genes are, as far as we know, only mutated somatically to contribute to oncogenesis, and about 10% of them are mutated somatically and also in the germ line where they confer heritable, inherited predisposition to cancer. But the most interesting thing about this slide is that number, because it indicates that already more than 2% of the genes in the human genome if mutated in the correct way, can contribute to the development of cancer. And we can classify those cancer genes in many different ways, according to their functionality, according to the pathways they're in. But one relatively robust way, which has st stood the tests of time, is to ask whether they are acting in a recessive manner, in other words, where, whether both alleles are mutated, and when that's the case, usually those mutations are inactivating, or whether they are dominant, in which case only one allele is mutated, and usually that mutation is activating. And if we look at those 400-odd cancer genes, we find that currently most of them, 
act in a dominant manner, and only a relatively small proportion, small number of those 400 genes are in a recessive manner. This is almost certainly an ascertainment bias because an awful lot of these dominantly acting cancer genes come from studies of translocations in leukemias, lymphomas, and sarcomas. And because those studies were dependent on cytogenetics, a very old technology which has been very effective for 30 or 40 years, they have favored finding those dominantly acting cancer genes. As I'll show you in a moment, many of the genes that are being discovered by systematic sequencing of cancer genomes are in fact in this category. So I'm going to present to you today studies, all of which are unpublished, although I expect they will be in the next um, two or three weeks. And they, are, they illustrate how we can use systematic sequencing of cancer genomes to explore two points. Firstly, what is the landscape of driver mutations in cancer? And secondly, what are the processes of somatic mutation that have been operative? And I'm going to use breast cancer as an example, but you could be delivered talks from this podium by many other speakers on other types of cancer. So first of all, let's look at that landscape of driver mutations in cancer. And for this, I'll show you data from an exploration of breast cancer genomes, which is in its principle, in its conception, very simple. What we've done is we've sequenced the exomes, in other words, the coding exons of the 21,000 or more protein coding genes and thrown in a few microRNAs. So we've sequenced the coding exons and we've already also looked for copy number changes in them. And we've done that to 100 breast cancers of which 79 were estrogen receptor positive and 21 estrogen receptor negative. So we sequenced the coding exome of those 100 breast cancers and of course normal DNAs from the same individuals because we're really only interested in the somatic mutations so we have to extract away the, and subtract away the inherited variation. So what we do with that information is we use a suite of software, which I won't go into, to call somatic-based substitutions, somatic indels, and somatic copy number changes. So we get a catalog of variants from each of those hundred cancers. The next thing we have to do is to see whether we can find new cancer genes. And the way that we do that is using a very simple statistical approach which has been the robust basis of identification of new cancer genes by genetic methods for the last 30 years. And the basis of that is to make the assumption that mutations that are generated in, cancer, in the genomes of cells, somatic mutations, are randomly distributed. And therefore, if you look at 100 different cancers and you find that the mutations are piling up in one gene more than you would expect by chance, then you begin to suspect that the reason that those mutations are accumulating in that particular gene is because those mutations are conferring selective advantage to the cell, which is why it's emerging as a cancer. So that approach, as I've said, has been used for many years and it's pretty robust. The problem with it is that the primary assumption is wrong, and that's what we have to watch out for in the future. Because the primary assumption that mutations are randomly distributed across the genomes of cells in which they occur is clearly not correct. We are finding many, many aspects of the landscape of genomes which are causing mutations to accumulate in one gene more than another, in one part of the genome more than, in, more than another. And what that means is we have to be cautious about using that statistical approach to identify new cancer genes, and we have to layer on functional validation that they genuinely are new cancer genes. Nevertheless, that's the approach that we have used, and I think in the examples I'll show, it's probably pr proven robust. 
So we identify new cancer genes, and then we are going to be finding from this exome sequencing mutations in already known cancer genes, mutations that look pretty much like drivers because they're in genes that we know are mutated and contribute to cancer. And from that, from finding the new genes and finding mutations in the old genes, we will be able to look at the landscape of driver mutations in breast cancer. So first of all, can we actually find any new cancer genes? Breast cancer has been studied for 30 years or more pretty assiduously. A number of cancer gene, mutated cancer genes have been found. Can we find any more? So the answer is, doing the study in the way that I've described to you, we find nine new cancer genes, genes which are somatically mutated, and those somatic mutations look like they're driver mutations on the basis of criteria I've told you. And I'll just illustrate some of the patterns that we're finding. This is one of the new genes, NCOR1. And these lollipops here represent the somatic mutations that we found in this gene. And you can see that they're mainly colored in red, and red indicates that the mutation is truncating. So it will inactivate the function of that protein, protein uh, from this gene. And you can also see there are some red bars here, and these represent homozygous deletions, deletions of both copies of all or part of this gene. And that's both of these truncating mutations and homozygous deletions are typical of what you'd expect of recessive cancer genes, genes that are inactivated, also known as tumor suppressor genes. So this one looks pretty much like a tumor suppressor gene. This one, MAP3K1, is you can see most of the um, lollipops are again red, indicating that most of the mutations are truncating and that this is, a, again, another inactivated gene, probably a recessive cancer gene, a tumor suppressor gene. And if we look through the nine genes, new cancer genes that have been found, you'll see that most of them have red lollipops. Most of them, not all, but most of them are recessive cancer genes, tumor suppressor genes. And this is more or less the pattern that is being found by systematic sequencing of cancer genomes in most cancer types. In terms of the functionality of the nine genes, some of them are on signaling pathways, controlling cell growth and apoptosis. Many of them are in, are in genes that form part of chromatin modifying complexes and in fact the finding of mutations in chromatin modifying genes has been one of the major findings from this latest wave of new genes found by cancer genome sequencing. Some of the genes are involved in the cell cycle, others are involved in the differentiation from stem cells. So a wide range of functionality of these new genes, but most of these functionalities have been encountered previously in the set of genes that we knew about before. So nine new cancer genes in breast cancer. The next stage is to start looking at that genomic landscape of driver mutations in this cancer type. And I'll do that showing you a plot of this nature. The cancer genes are listed down here, and this bar represents the data from just one of those 100 breast cancers. And where the bar is colored in, as you see here, that means that there is a driver mutation in the relevant cancer gene. And if we can do that for one cancer, and where it's blue, it's a copy number change, and where it's red, it's a point mutation, a base substitution or an indel driver mutation. And if we can do that for one, we can do that for all 100 cancers. So that's the basic landscape, and it has a number of features. The first is this. There are 40 genes in that list. <clears throat> And that's addressing one cancer, breast cancer. So there are 40 cancer genes with driver mutations involved in breast cancer. In fact, almost certainly, that number is an underestimate. And it would be completely unsurprising if the list of driver mutations in cancer genes and list of cancer genes reached 60 in that one particular type of cancer. So with 60 different cancer genes, it's the first hint 
that breast cancer is going to turn out to be genetically an extremely heterogeneous condition. And that's the main message from this landscape. So those are the 40 cancer genes that we know of at the moment. Of course, they're not all mutated equally frequently. And I've shown that on the right-hand side. So some of them, in for example, this top line here, are mutated really quite frequently. And indeed, the top four genes will be familiar to most of you, P53, PIK3CA, uh, B2, and MYC. Those are the top four. So we haven't actually found a new commonly mutated cancer gene. However, if we now look at this landscape of driver mutations, if we take the genes which are mutated in 10% or more of breast cancer, then the driver mutations in them account for about 55% of all the driver mutations in this plot. In other words, 45% of the driver mutations are found in relatively infrequently mutated cancer genes. So we can't be ignoring those relatively infrequently mutated genes because about half of the oncogenic drive is being contributed by them. And you can see here that there's this long tail of bona fide driver mutations in cancer genes, but many of these genes are operative really in only a very small proportion of breast cancers. And indeed, as time goes on, this tail is likely to elongate further. So that's the landscape of the genes and their contribution. That we can now look at that key metric of cancer development, which is how many driver mutations does it take to generate an individual cancer? And that's shown here, where the numbers of drivers are piled up above each cancer. So the number of drivers ranges from one to about six. Indeed, there is one milestone on this plot because you can see that for almost every breast cancer now, at least one driver mutation has been found. There are these few here which don't yet appear to have a driver mutation in them. We could easily have missed it. There are all sorts of reasons why we could have missed some of the drivers in this, um, in this study. But despite the fact that our sensitivity isn't complete, you can see that 95% of the breast cancers have at least one driver, and that's a real milestone for cancer research. There is, though, substantial variation between cancers which only have a single driver and cancers which have six drivers, and we don't really, at the moment, understand what the meaning of that is. We also are rather surprised, I think, to find cancers which only have one driver. As I said right at the beginning, the expectation has been for common adult epithelial cancers that there will be multiple drivers and of the order of five to seven. Well, at the moment, we're not finding five to seven drivers in many of the common adult epithelial cancers. It may be that we're missing them, it may be that some of these so-called drivers are embodied in epigenetic changes. Whatever the answer is, at the moment we're not finding them, and this is what the landscape looks like. Now, I've already said to you that the number of 40 genes suggests that there's going to be considerable heterogeneity. And that heterogeneity, that diversity of genetic background in breast cancer is illustrated here because what I've done is I've selected just three of those 100 breast cancers, <clears throat> each with their driver mutations colored in. And what you can see as you look down this line is that they do not share any driver mutations in common. This one with five drivers, these two with four drivers, there's nothing shared between them. These three cancers coming out of the patient would be sent to the pathologist, and the pathologist would report them all as breast cancer, ductal, estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative. They would report all three of them exactly the same way, and the clinician receiving that report would treat them all essentially in the same way. And yet what we're seeing here is that these are genetically 
completely different species. And there is therefore huge diversity, underlying genetic diversity within this one disease that we call breast cancer. Indeed, if we go back to the overall landscape, from these 100 breast cancers, there are 73 different combinations of mutated cancer gene present. That means that almost every breast cancer in this series differs from every other breast cancer in terms of its genetic constitution. So it's a hugely genetically diverse disease. The question is whether it matters. So some would say that although there are all these different cancer genes operative, once we know a little bit more about the architecture of cellular circuits, we'll find that most of these genes fall in the same pathways or networks, whatever you want to call it, and therefore that despite this genetic diversity, the biological effects of that gen genetic diversity will be compressed down to a few common effects in terms of biological outcome. The alternative view <coughs> is that that genetic diversity is going to have an impact. It's going to have an impact on the phenotype of the cancers in the way they grow, in their progression, and in their response to therapeutics. And if I had to make a choice, I would go for somewhere between. I'm sure that some of these different cancer genes are going to be doing more or less the same thing to the cells in which they occur. But I'd be very surprised if this genetic diversity does not have some manifestation, some impact on for example, the therapeutic diversity that we see in breast cancer, and indeed could begin to explain it. <clears throat> so that's what the landscape of driver mutations is looking like. We can move on to what are the processes of somatic mutation that have been operative in these breast cancers. And this is really quite an interesting question. Because although we know that, breast, that cancers, breast cancers, any other cancer, these are 100% genetic diseases caused by somatic mutations, we actually have a really rudimentary idea as to what the somatic mutation processes are that have generated those mutations in the first place. But we can use this genomic data from cancers to begin to get some insights. So first of all, we can look at our data that we've already been talking about from those 100 breast cancers that have had their exome sequenced. And now, instead of just looking at the driver mutations, we look at all the mutations, the drivers and the passengers, and we count them up. So each bar is the data from one of those 100 breast cancers, and the height of the bar represents the number of total somatic substitutions found in each cancer. And you can see there is massive diversity. So there's a cancer here, a breast cancer, which has eight somatic mutations in the whole of the coding exome. And there is this one here, which has almost 700. So two orders of magnitude difference between those two cancers in terms of the overall mutational load. And really, we've only got two parameters in which to explain that diversity. If you remember, I showed you that cellular lineage from fertilized egg to cancer cell. And the factors that can account for the difference between this cancer and this cancer are the number of cell divisions in that lineage. More cell divisions, more time, gives more opportunity to accumulate somatic mutations, and the mutation rate. And if one had to put one's money on it, one would expect that actually it must be differences in mutation rate predominantly that cause the difference in this cancer from this one. But we don't know of any somatic mutation processes that have been operative in breast cancer, certainly none that would cause a hundredfold difference in mutation rate. So there's clearly something to be found out about mutational processes operating in breast cancer, an area that we know almost nothing about. So to elucidate this a little bit more, I'll move on from the sequencing of 100 exomes from breast cancer now to sequencing whole cancer genomes. And this we have done in 21 breast cancers. The actual types of breast cancer don't matter here at the moment, but that's what they were. 
what matters is what you find. And so from those 21 breast cancers, we were able to find 180,000 somatic substitutions from those 21 across the whole cancer genome. 183,000 compared to from the 100 exomes, we found 7,000. So it's that difference in numbers that is going to give us a completely different microscope for looking at these somatic mutational processes. Hugely more statistical power. So we have 21 breast cancers in which we have somatic mutation calls all around the genome. And I've illustrated them here in this set of panels. Each of these is one of the 21 breast cancers. And you can already begin to see what I showed you previously, that there are differences in the numbers of mutations because each of these bars represents the number of each of the six different classes of base substitutions. So this cancer has relatively few. This one has got a load more. So this is the beginning of characterizing the mutational processes because we don't count all substitutions as exactly the same but we have divided them into the six basic subclasses of somatic substitution and given them different colors. And you can begin to see here that there are already different patterns emerging. So here is a breast cancer which has a lot of red and black mutations, C to T and C to G, while here is a breast cancer which has a lot of green and sort of pinkish mutations which are in this set of categories. So there are different patterns of somatic mutation, even when we look in this very simple way at the six classes of base substitutions. But we can do a much better job than that. And I'm going to illustrate how we do that using these two, two of the 21 breast cancers that I was just showing you. So for both of these, we have classified the mutations into these six substitution categories. But we can add a much greater refinement to that classification. So instead of refer, um, reporting or showing C to A mutations here as this blue bar, the C to A mutations here are represented as 16 squares. And the reason that they're represented in this way is because we're not only taking into account the mutated base, which is a C, and the, the base to which it goes, which is a T, it's a C to, sorry, which is an A, which is a C to A change, but we're also looking at the base immediately five prime, immediately before the C, and the base immediately after the C. In the expectation that the base immediately before and after the mutated base will influence the sorts of mutations that occur. So what is illustrated here is these are the bases before the mutated base, and these are the bases after the mutated base. And therefore, for example, this base, this square here, represents C to A mutations at T, P, C, P, T trinucleotides. And then what we do is we ask how many mutations there are in each of those trinucleotides across the cancer genome, and we ask, is that, are they being overrepresented compared to the frequency of those trinucleotides in the reference genome? And that overrepresentation is shown if the square glows out at you red. So what is this showing us? Well, here you've got a red stripe. What does that mean? Well, it's C to T mutations because that's what's above this square. And you can see that the five prime base doesn't seem to matter very much. There's overrepresentation, whatever the five prime base is, but it's the three prime base which seems to matter, which is a G. So this, these are basically C to T's at X, P, C, P, G's. This should be a familiar pattern to many of you. These are C to T transitions at C, P, G dinucleotides. This is a mutational process that we've been familiar with for a couple of decades now and is thought to be due to methylation of cytosines at CPG dinucleotides. So at least we can find things that we already knew were there. What about this one? So this is another breast cancer, and again we have got this stripe. So again we've got the C to T at CPGs. But now, in addition to this vertical stripe, we've got a horizontal stripe. 
So these are C to T mutations and C to G mutations. But now, what seems to matter is that these are taking place right after a T. So the five prime base to the C to T and C to G mutations seems to be a T. And now the three prime base doesn't seem to matter. So these are C to T at TPC PG and C to G at TPC PG. What's interesting is twofold. First of all, we have no idea at this moment, although I'll give you some speculations later, what is causing this. But what the plot is showing you is that we can now see two mutational processes operating essentially independently in a cancer. We've got the C to T at CPG, which is present in both, and then we've got this one occurring just in this cancer. So we're beginning to get the flavor that you can have multiple mutational processes operating in cancer, and they operate independently of each other. They sort of supplement each other. So this is all fine, but we can only get so much from looking at these plots. Our visual system and our brain can only compute to a certain extent. What we need is a mathematical approach to extract these patterns of somatic mutation. And the problem is that this is quite a big problem because there's an awful lot we don't know. We don't know how many mutational processes there are. We don't know what their features are in terms of the mutations they cause. We don't know how strong they've been in each of the cancers. We hardly know anything. Well, it turns out that this is a, um, this is a well-known problem in, in mathematics, a sort of blind source separation problem, and there are approaches to get round it, and this is one of them, called non-negative matrix factorization, NMF, which applied to the, these sorts of data can extract biologically meaning, fe meaningful features. And so in this paper, it was, exp it was applied to faces of individuals, and what it extracts is meaningful components, such as eyes or the mouth or the components of the face that we're familiar with. And it's those familiar components that we want NMF to pull out from the mutational patterns. So that's what we've done. We've applied this to the genome, to the catalogs of mutations from those 21 breast cancers. And from that, we get out five, it turns out, mutational processes. The first one in green here, I've, I put the features in, and you can see these are all C to T mutations at CPG dinucleotides. So that's what we saw previously. That's one process. The second, these are C to T mutations and C to G mutations. And if you look carefully at these, you can see that before each of the mutated bases, there's a T. So again, this is what we saw by looking at those heat maps previously. There are then two kind of rumbles of mutation which look very similar to each other. In fact, they are different. And with this application of the algorithm, it much prefers to have them both there. It doesn't like it if you try and merge them into one. And then there's this final mutational process, which is only C to G mutations. And so we were unaware of the mutational process from looking at the heat maps that was only C to G. But when you look at it carefully, it has very much the same features as this mutational process B, except it's missing all of these. So we have five mutational processes. We know what this one, we believe we know what this one is. We have very little idea about this one, these four. I'll try and finish quickly. The, what the algorithm can then do, it can see what contribution each of these mutational processes makes to the mutational catalog of each of the cancers. So if we come back to these two, the algorithm computes that about half the mutations in this cancer are due to the process A, the green one, which has C to T's at CPG's as a strong feature, but is now showing that the, uh, some of the other processes are actually, actually operative here. In this cancer, again, you've got some of the green process A with the C to T's at CPG's, but this cancer is overwhelmed by mutations with that TPC feature. 
And if we can do it to two, we can do it to all 21, which is shown here. And indeed, if we look at those mutational patterns, we can see that they differ substantially across the cancers. With some cancers with a lot of green, process A, and some cancers with very little. So we're seeing now how the mutational processes are contributing to the genesis of cancer, and we can see how they are, the extent to which they're accounting for the mutations. So Varda, if you'll bear with me just one moment, I realize I've gone on too long, but um, there is one possibly even most interesting thing in the final couple of slides. All the mutational processes I've been showing you thus far have been more or less evenly distributed in the genome. But the question is, are some processes targeted to specific parts of the genome? So we decided to look at that. And it turns out that there are regions of the genome which are hypermutated. And that hypermutation phenomenon we've called cotegis, which is thunderstorm in Greek. And the way I'm going to display it to you is in this sort of plot. This is a plot from one breast cancer. Each of the dots is one somatic mutation, and the mutations are ordered from the top of chromosome 1 down to the bottom of chromosome X. It's not along the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the actual mutation numbers, the positions of them, but they're just ordered in the genome in that sort of way. What this is showing, what the y-axis is showing, is the distance from a particular mutation to the previous mutation. And so you see a cloud of mutations up here at about a megabase distance from each other because there are about a couple of thousand mutations in this genome, and if they're randomly distributed, they'll be about a megabase apart from each other. So that's what that is showing, and this is a sort of uninteresting genome. This is what you find in some genomes. In this genome, there is a splodge here of mutations which are incredibly close to each other. 10% of the mutations in this genome are right next to each other. And this is a particular pattern in this particular genome, but in this genome, you've got a slightly different pattern, where instead of having this sort of thunderstorm of mutations in a particular part of the genome, actually you've got trickles, little showers of mutations in various different places in the genome. And this is a completely unknown phenomenon previously which emerges from very simple sequencing of these genomes. And you can see that the colors of the mutations in these regions are different from the mutations up here. So the mutations occurring in these regions of cotegis, of hypermutations, are particularly C to T in this cancer. And there are many distinctive features of these mutations. I'll go through that. And the other feature of these clusters of mutations, so we're looking at this genome, but now we are looking along the genomic co coordinates, and this cluster is compressed into this small region on chromosome 6. These are base substitutions compressed into a 14 megabase region of chromosome 6, and what we find when we look at another class of mutations is that there are very densely aggregated rearrangements in exactly the same region. So this is a phenomenon of hypermutation of both base substitutions and rearrangements, which is targeted to specific parts of the genome, but in different cancers, it's in a completely different part of the genome. It's nothing about the specific genomic architecture. They are very diverse. So, to summarize, driver mutations in more than 40 cancer genes contribute to the development of breast cancer. So it's a genetically hugely heterogeneous disease. And there are multiple processes of somatic mutation which have contributed to the genesis of this cancer type. There is a process of very localized hypermutation, which is active in about half, it turns out, of breast cancer genomes. And what you'll have noticed is I haven't told you, or I haven't speculated at all, about the mechanisms underlying any of these, 
because actually we know hardly anything about them. So with there, I'll close, thank our collaborators, the people in the group who've done all the work. This is the Sanger at night. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>